pain has reached epidemic proportions in America. I'm Dr. Paul Christo. This is Aches and Gains. Dr. Paul Christo is one of America's leading experts on relieving pain. He's board-certified, Harvard-trained, and a pain medicine specialist at Johns Hopkins. U.S. News & World Report ranks him as a top doctor and among the top 1% in the nation for pain management. Becker's Review selected him as one of the 70 best pain management physicians in America. He's listed as a super doctor for the Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Northern Virginia area. Aches and Gains is a weekly talk show covering all aspects of pain and pain relief. The human impact is real. Older adults, children, and even infants struggle to cope with pain. But there's hope, and there are treatments that can ease pain and suffering. The show offers compelling stories about people who've found relief. We share cutting-edge treatments from contributing experts, and we offer ways to help people cope with their pain. Welcome to the show. Have you ever wanted to sink your hands into a piece of clay and rip it apart when you're angry or upset? It's a tension reliever and can make you feel so much better. Imagine using an art form like clay or paint or photography as a way to control your pain. You might be surprised to find out just how effective art therapy helps you manage your physical symptoms, reduce anxiety, and re-engage in life. As a mind-body intervention, art therapy has shown promise as a holistic treatment for chronic pain. Our first guest, Rachel Lozano, is an art therapist herself. She's lived with pain for 18 years after she was diagnosed with a rare tumor affecting her spine called an Askins tumor. Rachel's done a remarkable job of overcoming substantial muscle and nerve pain through art therapy. She's here to share her story. And our second guest is Megan Robb, art therapist and assistant professor in art therapy counseling at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Megan worked in clinical practice at the National Institutes of Health for five years, spending time with pain and palliative care patients. She'll tell us who's best suited for art therapy, what kind of art forms are used, and how it can alleviate painful symptoms. Aches and Gains is supported by Medtronic, Teva Pharmaceuticals, The Pain Community, and Boston Scientific. For live online listening to Aches and Gains, please go to paulchristomd.com. To access podcasts of the show, please go to paulchristomd.com. Rachel Lozano is a cancer survivor who's overcome cancer pain, post-surgical pain, and chemotherapy-induced pain. She works at Mercy Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, as a counselor and art therapist. Rachel, welcome to Aches and Gains. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. My pleasure. You've been living in pain for about 18 years. How did it all begin? So pain kind of entered my life right before I was diagnosed with cancer. I was having some pretty intense pain in my back, which mm -hmm. turned out to be a tumor pressing on my spinal cord. Wow. What was the name of that tumor? Uh, it's called Askins tumor, and it's a subset of Ewing sarcoma. Mm -hmm. And an Askins tumor typically develops in the thoracic region and the pulmonary region of the body. It develops from the soft tissues of the chest wall, and particularly in the what's called the paravertebral region, that is the region that surrounds the spinal cord or the spine. Where was it located in you? Um, towards the top, and it was wrapped around and then had spindles that went throughout my back. Mm -hmm. I know it was on T3 and 4 and it was about egg size. Wow, egg sized. I mean, that was pretty big. So you had surgery? Yes. They had to do emergency surgery to remove that first tumor because mm -hmm. um, I had numbness and tingling throughout my legs and chest. They said it was going um, up my body by the hour. Well, so they had to do emergency surgery to try to relieve the pressure of that tumor. Wow, well, I mean, that must have been terrifying. Yes. Have you needed other surgeries? I have had two major tumor removal surgeries. They had to go through a big portion of my back. I had a tumor between my heart, lung, and spine. And then I had a bone marrow transplant. And then I had, um, just in the last few years, an entire um, lung removal on the right side. And then I had an um, open window for about six months mm -hmm. in the side of my chest cavity. And then our surgery to close that up, and they moved a lot of muscles and tissues and removed some ribs. Wow, I mean, that really is extensive. Where, where do you feel the pain today, Rachel? Current pain is more in my chest. I also have 
some arthritic aches and pains throughout my body, and then some abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned to me earlier that that your pain focuses in the upper back region that's sort of central and off to the right as well. Rachel, do you feel like your pain is muscular or neuropathic, that is nerve-related? I think there's probably a combination of both, just with a lot of the muscles moving and then the nerves that have been cut through. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. What does it feel like? Is it stabbing? Is it burning? I would say sometimes it's burning. Sometimes it's more of just kind of a steady aching feeling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sharp pains. It just depends. Do you ever get a a break from the pain? Parts of me have lived with pain for so long that I don't notice it as much. Mm -hmm. It's probably there most of the time, but only when it's pretty bad do I notice it as much. Yeah. Now, I know you had chemotherapy for the cancer. Did that produce any pain? I actually had some neuropathic pain in my feet Mm -hmm. that got pretty bad where they had to stop one of the drugs that I was getting. How bad was it? It got so intense that I was actually crawling around my room. Mm -hmm. That's when my mom knew that it was bad because I'm pretty stoic. Is it gone now? Uh, It took years, but it's mostly went away. Every once in a while, I still have some tingles in my feet and stuff from it. Well, but overall, it sounds like it's much, much better, which is great. Rachel, do you feel like over time, the pain has prevented you from achieving your goals in life? It took me over 10 years to get through all of my schooling and everything and Mm -hmm. get through my master's program. Illnesses and pain definitely slowed down that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I mean, I've gotten married and gotten to do a lot of other neat things in my life. Good. I really, truly try to just live my life to the fullest and pace myself in a way that mostly brings peace to my life. Absolutely. That's a powerful message to others that they can get through it too. Rachel, out of all the treatments that you've had for your pain, which has been the most effective? Massage has made a really big difference. And then also um, a lot of the pain I was having last year when all the muscles in my chest were moved, Mm -hmm. um, I went to an integrative physical therapist. Yeah. So she used massage and yoga as part of the physical therapy experience, and I found that to be extremely helpful. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, Today, where is your pain level? On a daily basis, maybe a four, or unless I really exert myself, it may get up to a six. And how often do you exert yourself? I try to do yoga a few times a week, and then sometimes walking and Zumba. I do find that if I could push myself and be active, then it definitely helps the pain. Good. Most people wouldn't believe this, but exercise can really help with pain. Now let's talk about art therapy. How did you hear about it? I was introduced to art therapy the first year that I was in treatment for cancer. Mm -hmm. My doctor's office had an art therapist that I started meeting with. Okay. You know, art therapy is a form of psychotherapy that combines visual art making and psychotherapy to promote self-exploration and understanding. What, What appealed to you specifically about it? I was a really big athlete, and I was unable to really continue playing sports at that point, and so... Art became really important, and it was a way for me to process what I was going through when I felt nobody else understood. Right, I can see that. Let's now delve into the process. What happens during the initial visit? They may be establishing goals that they want to work on together, Mm -hmm. or they may just be diving in and working on a piece of art to kind of get to know each other. And speaking of a piece of art, what art form did you choose when you began art therapy? Things like drawing, painting, oil pastels. Sometimes I would journal. Sometimes I would make things out of 3D materials. Wow, I mean, quite a variety. And how do you choose the art form? I mean, does the art therapist help guide that decision? We got to pick. She usually had a lot of different options for us. And it was also a way of letting us have control over something because Mm -hmm. with our treatments, you know, we didn't have a lot of control. So that was something that we could pick. Right, right. During the sessions, what are you asked to do? I mean, are you imagining, for example, how to represent your pain in visual form? So sometimes it would just start out as, what, what, what do you want to work with? And then I would just start doodling or drawing and see what happens. Or other times we would be working on something specifically. Mm-hmm. Like she would maybe say, what does pain look like? What would that look like in an art form? Rachel, Tell us about one of your drawings or paintings or constructions. I remember a specific one that I did. It was like an outline of a body, 
and I think I used probably markers or oil pastels Mm -hmm. and drew inside of the figure um, where the pain was and picked colors that I thought represented that pain. Mm. Uh, Any others? Yes. Um, I remember there was a very large piece that I did about my bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of complications and pain during that, Um, and it was a lot of brown colors, and it was a figure that was getting kind of sucked up by the hole that was in the canvas. Mm -hmm. And then, Rachel, does the art therapist help you then interpret that work? The therapist's role is to help the person to process and maybe see things in the painting that the patient may or may not see or may have done subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And so they're working together to process that. Okay, I see. Were there certain themes in your work? I mean, for example, did you often represent your pain in certain colors, red or black or green? Um, I think it depended. There, sometimes I think the pain was red or blue. Sometimes um, it was more of an abstract piece or um, more of an outline of a body. Mm-hmm. I know there was a series that I did with a little figure in um, like the fetal position inside of different things. So... I remember there was a fetal position inside of a pair of lungs. There was a fetal position in a raindrop. There was a fetal position in a tumor. So it kind of was like a theme throughout different pieces. Wow. How does the therapist help you interpret your art to reduce your physical symptoms of pain? By being a listening ear, which is always helpful, kind of like in normal talk therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, may not have um, come up right away, encouraging the patient to use their arms and draw and Mm -hmm. actually be moving around, which may not have happened otherwise. Now, you had an interesting experience with a client as an art therapist yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I actually just can think of an example yesterday with a patient. Um, He came into our activity room at work, and he was in tremendous pain, and his arm was in a sling. And then once he used his other arm that was free to start working on this art process, he was smiling and he did not think about pain for the next hour because he was so into the art process and focused on that. That's a great example of the power of distraction. How about art therapy and its ability to enhance your emotional well-being? I mean, for example, helping you cope with pain and reduce anxiety. And also having something physical to even show to friends and family that may not always understand. Absolutely. I think that it's great to have something to show to others to provide even more insight into what the pain experience is like. Rachel, thanks so much for being here today on Aches and Gains. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Join us for part two when we find out much more from Rachel about how effective art therapy can be. Straight ahead, Megan Robb art therapist and assistant professor in art therapy counseling at Southern Illinois University. I'm Dr. Paul Christo, and you're listening to Aches and Gains. Aches and Gains is supported by Teva, a leading global pharmaceutical company committed to increasing access to high-quality health care by developing, producing, and marketing affordable generic medicines, as well as innovative and specialty pharmaceuticals. If you have any questions or comments for Dr. Christo, please email him at achesandgains at gmail.com. That's achesandgains at gmail.com. Megan Robb teaches art therapy at Southern Illinois University. She spent five years in clinical practice at the National Institutes of Health, working with pain and palliative care patients. Megan, welcome to Aches and Gains. Thank you for having me on the show, Paul. You know, art therapy is considered a a mind-body intervention, but by definition, what exactly is it? Art therapy is a mental health modality. It's a mental health practice where you and your client or clients are using art as a form of thinking and reviewing about yourself for both wellness and uh, mental health treatment. Okay, tell us about the specialization that's required as an art therapist. Art therapists are trained, you know, at the master's level profession to really understand what are the different kinds of materials that evoke different kinds of change? How do we understand cultural sensitivity around using materials? What happens when a material evokes too much of a feeling? How do you recognize that and how do you help kind of contain that? Or how do you move somebody out of kind of an intellectual stage into a more emotional understanding? Right. It seems like the the process of art therapy can help people on the emotional level reduce conflicts, reduce 
stress and achieve insight. Megan, how does art therapy help create an awareness of how influential psychological factors and social factors are on pain symptoms? Well, that's a great question because um, what we know about um, using art therapy specifically in medical settings is that it um, can be used in kind of a spectrum way. So from distraction, relaxation, to um, having the client communicate their pain in a better way to their treatment team, Mm -hmm. to actually relieving some of those um, pains through mind-body intervention. How about the creative element to it, though? I mean, that's the most exciting and intriguing. Obviously, doing art is inherent. It's part of being human, right? So everybody's creative in their own way, gardening or cooking or drawing or doodling on their on their page. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, our therapists are adept at figuring out, like, what is the right material for that patient at that time. Well, and have you done that yourself? I mean, do you have an example of having done that? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, I have an example of a, a client that was um, really struggling with expressing his pain um, that was related to uh, a cancer. You know, the doctors would ask, is it a bone pain or is it a muscle pain? Where, you know, where do you feel it? Is it achy? And all of that. And he, you know, couldn't find the right word to communicate that and ended up drawing an image of his pain, and um, that became the metaphor that he could communicate with the doctors about his pain. Mm -hmm. And just being heard in that way and feeling like he was understood helped him, helped the doctors prescribe kind of the right medication and and give the right kind of psychosocial treatment that was around that, but also for him to kind of move past this place of not being able to kind of communicate the needs that he needs to be met in that moment. Um, It was really, really striking. It sounds like it, and it sounds like art therapy can be much more powerful than most people imagine. Uh, yeah, I think so, because as adults, just when they like pick up art materials, they might only have these memories of being in school, um, or you know, it, it may not be in their everyday practice. So the idea that it could have such a powerful influence on you know communication, but even reconciling some of their own feelings about adapting to having chronic pain or the Mm -hmm. loss or uncertainty that's part of a medical process. It just, um, it can be a place that kind of contains some of that information Mm -hmm. or even transform it for them. Right, exactly. Now let me ask you about the mechanism by which art therapy helps to control pain. I mean, is it a distraction from pain? That is, that is it, does it shift our attention or does it affect our neurophysiology? For example, uh, the pleasure that's derived from art therapy can increase dopamine levels or release endorphins. Our early research right now is about chronic pain in general, is about cancer-related pain, and it's more about quality of life, mm-hmm. symptom management in, in general ways okay. than it is about understanding, you know, what is going on in the hormone release within the brain. And fortunately, the field is still growing. Coming up next, how do patients get to art therapists? After the break, I'm Dr. Paul Christo, and you're listening to Aches and Gains. Aches and Gains is supported by The Pain Community, a web-based nonprofit created by people living with pain. Check out paincommunity.org for information, references, advocacy tools, and a premium section to securely interact with other members in forums and chat rooms. Boston Scientific, a leader in microelectric implantable technologies used to treat chronic neuropathic pain. Medtronic. A global leader in medical technology, alleviating pain, restoring health, and extending life for millions of people around the world. Visit TameThePain.com to learn about treatment options for chronic pain. Welcome back. We're here with Megan Robb, art therapist and assistant professor in art therapy counseling at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Megan, how do patients get to you? I mean, for example, would I, as a pain specialist, refer a patient to you for art therapy? You know, I think that nurses and doctors that are really involved in patient-oriented care have that sense. And so I think most of the time there's a pain and palliative team, there's mm-hmm. cancer specialists, there's doctors that understand thinking about the quality of life and how that may help symptom management for their patients. Okay, so right now it seems to be more of a focus on inpatient care, except that it sounds like there are outpatient programs in development. Megan, are there certain types of pain that are more responsive to art therapy? I mean, for example, someone with osteoarthritis versus headaches. Yeah, I've actually seen um, big changes in patients who have sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's like a chronic pain, 
part of that is just the isolation that comes from having sickle cell disease. Yeah. And so I think that that is kind of a reparative moment that could happen in a therapy session, a bedside therapy session that can kind of transform and also helping them think about, you know, what is their life as having sickle cell as part of their identity. Mm -hmm. So I guess art therapy can help elevate their self-esteem, which in turn would lead to more self-confidence and perhaps reintegration into their community. Now let's talk about art forms. What kind of art forms do you use for patients? I mean, you know, painting, drawing, photography. Common materials that you would find are whatever is kind of indigenous to that community or that area. So if there were a lot of newspapers around, maybe we would use newspapers and paint, modeling clay that was air dry, that wouldn't create a dust, watercolors, collage. Um, You know, you're really working with kind of assessing what your client is most engaged with and, um, Mm -hmm. and then what could be safely used in those spaces. Well, it's a great variety. Now, how do you decide what type of art material to use for each client? Similar to what you do when you meet a new professional, they kind of do a background interview of you of like what materials have you used before? Mm -hmm. How are you talking about your experiences? But I generally would start you off with materials that you felt comfortable with already. So if you use a pen and paper a lot, we would start with a pen and paper. And would you continue with a pen and paper throughout all the sessions? Or do you change it up and use, say, watercolor or sculpture at one point? Well, I wouldn't want to keep you in the same place if maybe you were hyper aroused at that stage. That's probably not a good place for your body. That's not a good place for your mind. So how do we help you be more calm? If you're going through like a pain crisis, what could help you center yourself or find more grounding? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I sent a patient to you, where would the patient find you? For example, an art studio, an office? Yeah, I think a lot of our therapists have kind of an office that looks like a typical therapist's office and then has an extra table, a big table in there, or easels or things like that. Mm -hmm. Set up might be like the creative version of a therapist's office. Okay. Now, are the sessions private or are there group sessions? Yeah, there's definitely both of those things. But that's very good for going through adjustments of your medical illness is how to have other people who are working through those things at different stages so then you can kind of see having this uh, chronic illness, what would it be like five years down the road or 10 years down the road? What is it like as a newbie? Absolutely. I mean, there's a great value to having group sessions. How long are the sessions? An hour, you know, an hour and a half. And Megan, how many sessions are usually required? Well, I guess that's the big question is that, you know, HMO is really kind of dictating therapeutic practice nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's generally around 10 to 15 sessions. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know HMOs can certainly limit the number of sessions with you, with me as a physician and, and other therapists. Once a patient produces an art form, do you interpret it? Or do you let the patient interpret it? Yeah, I'm having the client do that that work. I would never say, well, this is what you drew looks like um, beginning signs of a psychotic break or something like that. But I might ask <laughs> them questions around, you know, what are they thinking about it? And I might have hunches that I keep to myself like any therapist does. Like, let's see what they want to talk about and let me think about what I have in my head and see if they're congruent or not. And then what is the real truth behind this? Right. I feel like there's a great blending between the creative component of art therapy and the psychotherapeutic component. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I've always seen it as a marriage between those two, but there's something about it for you that feels like it's separate. I wish um, it wasn't on the phone that we were doing this and you could see really what materials look like or see someone's process, but we just don't have really good video of that out there in the general public. Well, you're doing a great job explaining it for us. Megan, I want to thank you so very much for joining us today. Sure, thank you, Paul. Please join us for part two when we find out much more about the value of art therapy in improving pain symptoms, as well as the benefits of art therapy in self-management. I'm Dr. Paul Christo, and thank you for listening. The views and opinions expressed in this radio program are solely the views of Dr. Paul Christo and do not necessarily express the views of this radio station and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, nor an endorsement by any or all of them of any of its content. This show provides medical information, not advice. 
please consult your personal physician before engaging in any course of treatment or use of any of the techniques or products discussed on this show. Discussion of particular uses of products on this show have not been approved by any of the manufacturers of such products. To access podcasts of the show, please go to paulchristomd.com. That's paulchristomd.com. Aches and Gains is produced by Tom Blair and Ty Ford. Elsa Langford is the technical consultant and engineer. Dr. Paul Christo is the executive producer. Thanks for listening. This is Aches and Gains with Dr. Paul Christo.